today. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they spread in the community, that this disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who is testifying. (laughs) I'm so sorry, let me go back. I'm going to go back to verse 9. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took them out of their sight. While he was going, they were gazing up toward heaven. Suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you to heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew and Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew, Bartholomew and Matthew, James son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot and Judas son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. May God add a blessing to the hearing, understanding, and living out of scripture. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Skylar. Uh, So well handled, right? Um, make a mistake, acknowledge the mistake, apologize, back up and make it right. Like that's a great life lesson for all of us, right? How many times have I been reading scripture and gotten lost and just kind of deer in the headlights kept going and hoped nobody noticed? So uh, I'm grateful for that and looking forward to having you with us this summer. Um, Can I get a witness? I wonder what images come to your mind when I ask that question. Can I get a witness? I would imagine that to some degree, the responses that uh, come to your mind, the images that that conjures up for you depend a a little bit on what you do professionally, right? If you're in the legal world, the question about a witness likely conjures up a person who will testify in the midst of your casework. I imagine that it also has uh, something to do with the tone of voice that I would use as I ask the question, right? Can I get a witness in a relatively conversational tone like that? Might not conjure up much in terms of images. But if I would change posture and tone and ask the question, can I get a witness? It likely conjures up different images in your mind, right? The Pentecostal, passionate, smarmy, revivalist preacher portrayed in television and movies who who can kind of make your skin crawl and your teeth itch. Can I get a witness? My sense is that that's a question that many well-intentioned and good-hearted mainline Protestant folks struggle with. And maybe it's because of those portrayals of the smarmy televangelists that come off as manipulative, and maybe it's just because of struggles that we have with giving voice to our story and sharing our story. But I believe that as people of faith, wherever you are on your journey, That as we think about the connections we make with God who created everything that is and the connections that we make with the human beings with whom we are in relationship, it's worth wrestling with that question. What do we mean by the word witness and how do we come to use that in the stories of our faith? At its very core, the word witness means a person who has seen or experienced something And to be a witness then means to be willing to speak to or share about that which one has experienced or witnessed. And so when we think about being a witness, it means being a person who's willing to testify, to share a story, to attest to, to vouch for. And when it comes to the way in which we live our lives as people of faith, today we bring to a close this series, uh, The Stories We Tell with a conversation around what it means to witness, to share our stories. Because as followers of Jesus, we are invited to experience and then to bear witness to what the Spirit is doing in our lives and in the world. Now for them, 
it was a liminal season, a liminal time. The word liminal comes from the Latin word limen, which means threshold, an entry point, or a beginning. And so the idea that it was a liminal time means that it was this in-between, the threshold or the beginning of something new. For those first followers of Jesus, it was a liminal time. It was after the resurrection, but it was before Jesus ascended into heaven. It was after Jesus was with them again in that time period following the resurrection, but before he was no longer with them and they were left on their own. It was after Easter, but before Pentecost. Today we engage the story of the disciples on what we understand to be Ascension Sunday, a celebration of that time when Jesus departs again from his presence here on earth and leaves the disciples to figure out what it is that they're doing on their own. It was a liminal time, a time when they were no longer here and not yet here no longer in ministry with the Jesus who had walked with them for several years, but not yet figuring out what it meant to be the church and to live in those new and those different ways. Liminal times are times of no longer and not yet. In between transitional times that can be energizing and exhausting at the same time. Life-giving and life-depleting at the same time. And for those earliest followers of Jesus, I imagine they are wrestling with all of this as they experience this liminal time, this no longer and not yet. And so I want to invite you again to take a look at that text from the book of Acts that we read this morning. Um, This story is about that time when Jesus has called the disciples together, gathering there uh, on the mountaintop, and he's offering instructions about what will come. And so if you look at the first chapter of the book of Acts, again, I would invite you to open your Bible to that, uh, another tab on your browser if you're there digitally, grab another device. But this first chapter of Acts lays the found work for what becomes the story of the church. Starting in verse 6, where Skylar read for us this morning, you might have a heading that says, The Ascension of Jesus. And it's this story about Jesus having called the disciples together. And as they gather together in verse 6, we read, The disciples start asking questions about what Jesus is going to do. Hey, Jesus, is this the time that you are going to do this? And in verses 7 and 8, Jesus responds and gives them those instructions. In verse 8, You, Jesus says, will receive power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You will be my witnesses when the Spirit comes. Not yet. Soon. You're no longer disciples who follow me because I'll no longer be with you, but you're not yet who you will be when the Spirit comes upon you. And again, I imagine for those disciples, this liminal time, this no longer and this not yet, was a confusing and a disorienting time. And as soon as this text comes to a close, that quotation closes, Jesus continues, and the action moves quickly. But before we transition through the rest of that story, I pause to to name uh, the way in which I most often think about this uh, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. I will confess over the years that I've preached and taught and worked with this text, I've almost exclusively thought of this in terms of geographic terms, right? This is what Jesus is doing here. He's talking about the expanding geography of the Middle East in the first century. Uh, In Jerusalem where they were, but then in Judea and Samaria, the region and the nation state around them, and then to the ends of the earth. When the Spirit comes, they will be witnesses here and a little bit further out and a little bit further out yet. And I do think that there is a geographic reality to this, but over the last weeks and months, I've begun to think about some other implications as well, and we'll get to those in a couple of minutes. Uh, But first, let's continue this journey with these disciples. In verse 9, after Jesus has said this to them, they're still watching, and he ascends into heaven, and he leaves their sight, and they're standing there, we're told, gazing, looking upward, and two men appear to them and ask essentially, what are you doing standing there looking up toward heaven? This Jesus who has been taken from you will come in the same way that you saw him go. 
And it's as if that explanation is enough for the disciples. And in verse 12, they return to Jerusalem from this Mount of Olives. It's about a Sabbath day journey. They go back to Jerusalem. They go into this room upstairs where they've been staying. We're told the whole gang's together. You know, Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon the zealot, Judas, son of James. And then verse 14 tells us that these who that we know have gone where, the what of what it is that they're doing. All of these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer. Together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as the brothers of Jesus. This community of disciples who has gone back to wait after Jesus has told them that they will be witnesses when the Spirit comes, their next move is to gather together with a diverse and inclusive group that includes women who had been part of that movement, that includes family members of Jesus, and they pray. Verse 14 says, constantly devoting themselves to prayer. In that liminal time, in that in-between, in that no longer this but not yet that, they're constantly devoting themselves to prayer. When I think about constantly devoting oneself to prayer and the posture of that, the image that came to my mind this week uh, is the honey badgers. Um, the Honey Badgers is Josh's baseball team, my eight-year-old son, and uh, I don't know a lot about baseball, uh, but I know that when an eight-year-old is really locked in and, and ready to play, uh, he's really good at ready position, right? So I asked Josh if he'd show us ready position this week, right? Um, a little out in the yard getting ready. We had our first kind of practice post-COVID shutdown yesterday afternoon. Ready position is when a person's got their knees bent and their eyes focused in. They've got their glove loose and ready to go. Ready position means that you can move. Ready position means that you can receive. Ready position means that you're watching and waiting for what it is that's going to come. And so I think about those disciples constantly dedicating themselves to prayer as assuming this ready position. And I don't mean to imply kind of the stereotypical posture of prayer that we think about, right? I mean, often when we think about prayer, we think about a person who's sitting there very still, uh, maybe eyes closed and head bowed and hands folded in front of them. And, and that is a good way to pray, but, but I'm not sure it's constantly devoted to prayer. I think about the New Testament invitation to pray without ceasing and the posture that that invites us to have as we engage all of our days, to have a, a ready position constantly devoting ourselves to prayer in the way that we watch for where God is at work, in the way that we're open and ready for what the Spirit would have for us, in the way in which we're ready to receive what God is doing in our lives and in the world. This is the experience part of what it means that as followers of Jesus, we are invited to experience and then to bear witness to the gifts of the Spirit at work in our lives and in the world. And so for us today, in many ways, like those first disciples, I believe we find ourselves in a liminal time on lots of different levels. I believe our world, our church, as individuals, we find ourselves in this liminal time, a time of no longer and not yet. On the most basic level, a kind of late May, Memorial Day weekend, we find ourselves in this funny cultural liminal space, right? It's no longer spring, but not yet summer. But when we think about the realities of things that have unfolded around us, we find ourselves today where the world is no longer like it was a couple of months ago, but not yet like it will probably be as some kind of normal evolves in the coming future. And many of these things, of course, are because of COVID-19 and the coronavirus and the way in which we have responded to that around the world. But there are also some realities of a liminal space and a liminal time uh, that pre-existed our shutdown of things a couple of months back. The church today in the world, for years, if not decades, has existed in a liminal time, a time when people no longer go to church simply for the sake of going to church, but in a time where we have not yet 
figured out what it means to resource people and support people as they seek to grow in their faith and to live their faith in all of those places they work and live and play. In so many ways, as religious organizations, as churches, as individual followers, there is this liminal season in which we find ourselves where we are no longer and not yet. And so I believe the invitation for us in this season, like those first disciples awaiting for the Spirit to come upon them, is to constantly devote ourselves to prayer with an openness and a trust that when the Spirit comes upon us, we will be witnesses to what God is doing. And I don't believe that that's a a once and for all. When the Spirit comes this one grand time, then we will be witnesses to that one thing. But I believe that time and time again in our lives, we are called to be open to the work of the Spirit, that when the Spirit comes and moves, we might respond and bear witness. And again, there's that kind of geographic connection that exists, right? Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria to the ends of the earth. We might say that, you know, we can be witnesses in Topeka and in Kansas and throughout the Midwest and to the ends of the earth. But over the last weeks and months, I've come to be thinking more and more about this text, not just in that geographic sense. There's a technological reality, I think, that we've seen unfold in these last couple of months. Those of us who have experienced God's love are invited to share God's love with text messages and emails, in Zoom meetings and social media, and to the ends of the earth. There's a local sense to this that I've become ever more aware of, even a hyper-local sense as people have sheltered in place for a season. As followers of Jesus who experience God's love, we are invited to bear witness to God's love in our family, with our next-door neighbors and our neighborhood, and to the ends of the earth. There is this ever-expanding series of concentric circles where we experience something and are invited to share something and then to move outward from there, whether it's geographic, whether it's technology, whether it's simple relationships in our most immediate neighborhoods. When the Spirit comes upon us, we will be witnesses here and in a broadening circle from there and to the ends of the earth. Because as followers of Jesus, whether you've been following Jesus for your entire life, whether you're a hesitant skeptic who has just found this worship celebration today, whether you're starting to wonder if maybe there would be some meaning or purpose or rhythm to living in connection and community with others, regardless of where you are on your journey, followers of Jesus are invited to experience and to bear witness to the work of the Spirit in our lives and in the world. Now, this liminal time is a strange time. The in-between, no longer this, but not yet that, can be a disorienting time, a frustrating time, a stressful time. But the good news is that even and especially in the midst of these liminal seasons, God is present. That when we find ourselves on a threshold for a new entry, a new beginning, a new start of some kind, when we prepare to move from a no longer to a not yet, the God who created and is with us always is present. And so my hope and my prayer again for you, whoever you are and wherever you are on your journey, is that you would find ways through connections to community and an openness to the Spirit to experience and to receive the gifts that Christ has for you the love and the acceptance, the comfort and the peace, the guidance that the Spirit has for you. And that as you experience that, you would come to bear witness to that increasingly in simple, conversational, relational ways to give testimony, to tell your story, to bear witness, to vouch for, to attest to the goodness of God in your life for the sake of others around you. Because you, I believe, are likely in a liminal space. You are no longer what you once were. You are not yet what you have the potential to be. And so my prayer for you would be that God would greet you in this liminal season and that you would find ways to experience and to bear witness to the work of Christ, to the work of the Spirit, to the work of God in your life and in the world. 
that you might experience transformation and partner with others and with God in being an agent of transformation for the world. Would you join me in praying together? God, we thank you for your presence with us always and everywhere. Especially in this liminal season, we give you thanks for the fact that when we are no longer in the realities that we once knew and not yet to the places where we might be going, that you are with us. And so when things are disorienting and uncomfortable, we pray for your peace. When we don't understand, we pray for your peace. And God, as we grow in that peace and a confidence in your peace and a trust in that peace that you offer to us, we pray that you will enable us to increasingly bear witness to your work in the world, that we might be your witnesses where we are and in those concentric circles that expand from there, our families and our neighborhoods, the technological connections that we make and share, here in Topeka, throughout Kansas and the Midwest, and to the ends of the earth. Be with us, O God, in ways that allow us to know and to trust your great love, and be with us in ways that enable us to share that love with others. All of this we pray in your holy and precious name. Amen.